Hello everyone and welcome to your video lecture on twin motion. This is part one of two videos on twin motion. In this first one, we are going to look at how to set up your materials, then how to set up your assets and place them around the room so that it looks realistic and lived in. And then at the end of the video, we'll look at how to set up your landscape so that it is all looking wonderful. That's all in this video. Then in the next video, we're gonna look at how to set up your lighting. Lighting is really, really important important to your perspectives that's why we have a whole extra video just on that and then at the end of the next video we'll look at how to set up your perspectives your camera and then how to export them out to pngs all right without further ado let's get stuck into twin motion all right so here we are in sketchup and we've got materials applied to our model we've got perspectives ready to go we know what we want the scenes to look like but the problem is SketchUp is only going to look <laughs> pretty much as good as this and not much better. Uh, that's not really good enough. What we want to do is get from here to something maybe a little bit more like this. This is much more respectable in terms of handing over to give to a client. Obviously not perfect. That tree's pretty ugly. It's not totally photo real. Some of the materials aren't quite right for what we're looking for. But if we're comparing apples and oranges here, we're going from this to something more like this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And this. By comparison, I mean rendering engines definitely are the way to go. And of course, we have got plenty of options available to us. We've already had a look at Enscape. This video will look at Twin Motion. There is also Lumion, there's V5, there's V Ray, all sorts of other engines. And then if you wanted to go above and beyond that, you could go up to something much more complicated, but also much more realistic with Unreal Engine. And I've got some videos on that too, if you are interested. But this time we are going to be having a look at Twin Motion. The reason I love Twin Motion, if I open up Twin Motion here, is at that base level. So we're talking about a point and shoot rendering software. That's Enscape, Twin Motion, Lumion. Those are probably the big three. I would argue Twin Motion gets a better outcome. The lighting is, in my opinion, better. Some of the materials are better. The problem is, it is not so point and shoot as Enscape is. Enscape literally plug in directly into SketchUp and we can just move the camera around, get the materials inside SketchUp working the way we want it to work, export out some renders pretty quickly. Twin Motion takes a little bit more fussing, a little bit more development and refinement. However, I truly believe that the end product is better. And the reason Twin Motion is better answers the same question as why does it take longer to do? And that's because there's more stuff inside Twin Motion. There are more things to control. More things to control means it takes more time. More things to control means you get a better result. So the choice is up to you. I would say that Twin Motion is the way to go for most people, especially considering Enscape now has a paywall for students. Twin Motion is completely free. Not only is the software itself free, but all of the assets are free inside as well. If we open up our mega scans, have a look inside our surfaces, for example, all of our different types of concrete sitting inside here and we can just download them and bring them in straight away. And that's all of our surfaces. We can also get inside and download some other 3D assets as well inside here, all totally free. And these are part of the Quixel Megascans library, which is from Unreal Engine, also owned by Epic Games. And that is the stuff that's being used by massive companies. Disney, they make all of the Marvel stuff, everything that you've seen in the Matrix movies recently, Star Wars stuff, all is through Quixel Megascan. So we've got access to incredible assets, all 4K, 8K resolution. They look beautiful, they look photoreal. So that's another benefit for using Twin Motion as well. I know that's a big sell, but I really do believe that if you've got the extra time, Twin Motion is the way to go. Enscape, great for point and shoot and just getting it done. Twin Motion when you really want to wow the clients and put something quite special together. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with Twin Motion. First up, we're going to have a look at how to install it on your computer. 
Okay, first thing we need to do is download the Epic Games launcher. Epic Games is the company that make Twin Motion, they make Unreal Engine as well, they make all the assets, so we definitely need that one. So type in Epic Games launcher into Google, it is the top one, and this is your download link, download it here. You will need an account, so if you don't have an Epic Games account already, you just need to make a new one, very straightforward, very easy, and just remember to make sure they know you're a student so you can get the free education version of Twin Motion. Once you have downloaded and installed the Epic Games Launcher, just open it up. You might need to sign in again your first time so that it comes up. Yours will probably look like this over on the news tab, something like this. We can scroll down and through here. What we need to do is go over here to the right on the Twin Motion tab. So if you click on Twin Motion, it will say the different versions of Twin Motion. Yours will say something like download or install, and you just want to install the latest version. So at the time of recording this video, I'm on 23.1.2, and so I would just click on install. Once you click on install or download, it'll start downloading in here, and then when it's ready to go, this will change over to launch. Sometimes you might need to, even after it's finished downloading, close out of the Epic Games launcher and then relaunch it again to be able to see this launch button. And then once we've done that, don't click on launch yet because we've still got one more step. We need to make the connection between SketchUp and Twinmotion. So let's go back over to Google, type in Twinmotion SketchUp. The top one here we're looking for is the Twinmotion Datasmith exporter. Basically, this is the live link which connects between SketchUp and Twinmotion so that you can go from one to the other. Now, if you're watching this video outside of this class and you're doing it for Revit or Rhino or Archicad, there are other Datasmith exporters. Same thing, just type it into Google and look for the one you need. In our case, looking at SketchUp, download whether you're using for Windows or for Mac and install that. You might need to close down SketchUp in order to do this. The reason why we're downloading the Datasmith exporter is just to make it a little bit more streamlined going from one to the other. There is a workaround for us in Twinmotion. You don't actually need the Datasmith exporter and some people find it a little clunky or more likely to crash. So you could just export your SketchUp model and then bring that into Twinmotion. But what that means is you won't be able to just click one button to update it. You'd have to save your SketchUp model, go back into Twinmotion, and then re-import that model again. So this just makes things a little bit faster for us. Go ahead and open up SketchUp and what you'll probably see the first time you open it if it's downloaded properly is the Datasmith buttons will be in the middle of the screen here. If that didn't open up for you, we can go over to View, Toolbars, and then this one right here in the middle, Datasmith, turn that on, click on Close, and this is what we're looking for. If you can't see this one inside View and Toolbars, it means it hasn't installed correctly. You might wanna go back into Google and reinstall that Datasmith exporter once again. Let's go ahead and lock this up here so that it's there ready for us to go. All right, now that we have our Datasmith buttons ready to go, we are going to create a new connection by exporting to Datasmith file. So this one up here, we're gonna click on export, and then we're gonna save this as a Datasmith file. So save that somewhere where you know it's going to go. I'm gonna click on save. And then we are ready to open up Twinmotion. So go on back to your Epic Games launcher. We're going to click on launch. And I'm gonna go ahead and skip to when that is open and ready. All right, so Twinmotion has opened this up for us. We don't need any of this stuff. You can have a look at that later if you want to. For now, let's just go ahead and click out of that. And this is our default scene. So we can look around in here. We can see a whole lot of desert and not a lot of much else. So we need to get our SketchUp model in and we need to get that Datasmith link working. So we go to import, we're gonna click on plus. And then we're gonna to go to direct link. So if you're on geometry, just change it over to direct link. And then we're looking for the one. So it's automatically sensed it for us. It's seen that this is the one that we've just made, which is great. It's done that for us. So all we need to do is click on import. And there we go, our house has now loaded. We can see it over there, looking pretty average, but don't worry, we'll get to that in a second. Now, as I said before, if your Datasmith link isn't working for you, there is the option to just bring it in manually. So if we change over from direct link to geometry, we can go ahead and open and navigate to our file and we can see there it does 
accept SketchUp files. You can just go ahead and choose your SketchUp file and bring it in. What that will mean though is instead of being able to live update it inside SketchUp, you'll just have to come back down here and reload it after you've saved it in SketchUp. One extra step, but doesn't add too much extra hassle for you. So let's go ahead and have a look at our model. First things first, just getting to know how to move around. So our right click allows us to look around our left click allows us to kind of pan around and jump around. I find that a little bit awkward to be honest. I typically just use the right click and the scroll wheel button is this kind of Z axis move around again, a little bit awkward for me. What I typically do is the W A S D keys. So W allows us to go forward. A allows us to go left. S allows us to go backwards. D allows us to go forwards. The number keys up the top, one, two, three, four, are your speed. So if I change this to four, it'll go a little bit faster. Five, it'll go faster again. And then once I'm up close to the house, I'll notice that that's probably too fast for me to be moving around. So I might change that back down to three so I can just move around. So particularly when I come to taking a shot later and I just want to micro adjust it, something like that, I'll typically use three, four for most of the time while I'm doing my modeling. That's a nice pace. If I need to jump somewhere quickly, I'll up that to five so I can really quickly zoom through stuff. So that's my WASD. We can see that there allows me to move around forwards, backwards. Now, if I change to using Q and E, this is how I go up and down. So Q allows me to go up, E allows me to go down. So W, A, S, D, and then Q and E. So those are all of our movements. And typically I'm holding down my right click button while I'm moving around so that I can look in the direction I want to move. So if I hold down the W key and then move my mouse at the same time while I'm holding down a right click, that will allow me to just kind of move around freely. <laughs> Sorry if I'm making you sick there. So you'll notice the base is not particularly attractive inside twin motion, but don't worry, as I showed before, it does get a whole lot better. Once we've done our lighting materials, assets, and started to control the camera a bit more, we are going to see this model go from strength to strength and really create some beautiful client perspectives. Now, something you will have seen on this model and back in our SketchUp as well, if we open this up, is that I do have materials already loaded in SketchUp. And the reason this is important is that whatever material you have inside SketchUp is going to come through into Twinmotion. And then when we change a material, everything that was on that material will change at the same time. So for example, if I go into library and into materials, if your library is not shown by the way, it's just down this corner here, library, and then we're gonna go up to materials and then brick. And let's go ahead and download a cinder block. So these basic materials will already all be in there for you, which is excellent. And then I'll show you how to download some of the ultra high resolution quicksilver materials in a second as well. So first one, let's go ahead and put this on here. And we'll notice that everything that is the same material, i.e. this glazing, it's going to apply the material to everything. This grass, it's putting it everywhere. All of these stepping stones are the same. All of that timber is the same. So the reason I mention this is that if you have all of your SketchUp model, the same default material, and you haven't applied any materials yet inside SketchUp, you're going to find that you can only apply one material to your model. Now, obviously construction buildings are not made up of one material. So if that is you, you're going to have to go back and spend another half an hour or so inside SketchUp, applying some materials around to your model so that you can bring it into twin motion again and then start putting the proper twin motion materials. Now, as long as the materials on SketchUp are slightly different, even microscopically different, a pink and a red, doesn't matter. Twin motion will still see them as different materials. So I usually will put the materials that I'm roughly looking for just so that I can remember what I've done. Bricks are called bricks, grass is grass, concrete's concrete, and then we've got a brass steel up there, timber's timber. That just makes it easier for me to remember what I'm doing and for me to be able to see that I've actually covered everything in the right material. If you wanna just do a bunch of colors, we've got blue walls up here, green walls down there, doesn't matter, whatever you wanna do inside SketchUp, you just need to make sure that you're distinguishing what materials are which. 
So I've put all of these bricks are bricks, all of this timber inside here is timber, and that makes it a lot easier for me when I get back into Twin Motion. So you go ahead and save that once that's done, and then if you've made those changes, you will click on this button up here to sync it if you're using the data smith. Or if you didn't use the data smith, you just have to come back down to your geometry and click on the refresh and that will live update that for you. So by way of example, let's go ahead and just change something in SketchUp. I am using the data smith, so it does make it a little bit easier for me. I'm just going to move this out here just so that nice extreme example, you can see that clearly. Click on that. If I go back into here, we'll see that it has moved it out for us. Obviously, that's not what we want, but that shows you the benefit of the Datasmith link is that it's all there for me within one click. So I go back into SketchUp, press Control Z, and press on the refresh button, jump back into Twin Motion, and it's moved it for us. Really, really good. Only one extra step though if Datasmith doesn't work for you, file save as back to your geometry in the import section and then click on the refresh button and it will work just the same for you. All right, first things first, let's go ahead and get all of our materials working. I wanna get started with this brickwork first. Now I can hit T to bring up the eyedropper. If I've got a material in there that I'm already happy with, that will bring it up in the materials box for us. So I click on here, open materials, and it says it's this one here. So if I click and drag and drop that, that should apply it to the other sections for us. Let's keep applying. Oh, something's gone wrong with scale there. We'll go ahead and have a look at that in a second and see what's going on. And definitely something going wrong with our scale up the top there as well. Uh, and something happening with our scale there too. So we've got different textures in SketchUp and some of them are causing a little bit of mischief for us. So first thing I'll do is undo all of this, Control Z, because I want to be able to isolate individual materials with those troublemakers. So now that I've undone that, what I will do is I'll come back and I'll put a new cinder block. So back into materials, I'm going to put this one over the top here and we'll notice that makes a second one inside our material section here. So if I click on that, what I'm going to do is just try bumping up the scale first. Sometimes the coordinates of the textures from SketchUp, can be grossly out of scale and that causes issues like this where we can't actually see the texture. And it looks like it's tiny texture, so what I'm gonna do is just try bumping it up to 100 and see what happens. Ah, <laughs> pretty, pretty close actually. Yeah, happy with that. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just put that down to 75 and that is looking close-ish. Maybe 60 is the way we want. Just thinking back to our case study, I reckon that is probably about right. Okay, so now we've got two options there. We can keep adding these and we can see which one is going to work for which. All right, that looks good. We can try that on this one and good. Okay, so these ones here now are a little bit funky. So we're just gonna to have to change these. So if I go back into the first one, which is what this one is here. So this tab over on the right hand side is our properties tab. It's where we can make all of the changes to whatever we've got selected. At the moment we've got this material selected. So that's what shows up there. If I click on the grass, it shows us that we're currently selected grass at the moment. So T or click on the eyedropper tool. I want this particular material. There we go, we can start editing that again. So first thing, I'm going to bring the scale down a little bit so it matches the other one. Let's try 0 0.6. Okay, that might be all right. And then I'm going to open up the details tab in there and I'm going to go ahead and try stretching this a little bit. Yeah, that's looking a bit better. And then maybe it needs to come down on the Y to match the other ones. No, nope, too much, take it back. Let's put that up to 0.6. Okay, and then let's try moving that on the Y and see what happens. Okay, so we're getting pretty close. Might have to just do this incrementally. So I'm gonna go 0 0.01, see what happens. That's moved it the wrong way. So let's go negative 0 0.02. Cool, too far. Negative 0 0.015. Okay. 
And then we can just keep finessing that and making sure that's in the right position. I'd say if anything, the scale is a little bit too big as well. So we could bring this down to 0.55. And then we just keep massaging that and getting that working. At the moment, for illustration's sake, so that you're not watching me doing that for hours, I would say that's fine. And you can go ahead and fix that up yourself. Make sure that's working for you. I've got this little guy under here as well that I need to do and I can see that that's a wrong size again and that's different to the other two. So what I'll do is I'll make a third one inside here, cinder block, drag it over again and then I'm just going to scale that one up a little bit this time. So let's go 1.5. Uh, yeah, pretty close. Okay, cool, happy with that. So that's all of our stone work done. Let's have a look at adding some different types of materials. I want to add some glass in here. So I'm going to change over the SketchUp glass into twin motion glass. Cool, and let's do the other one up here as well. Now, first impressions, not good. Okay, we're not happy with that. However, we have some opportunity to play around here. So once again, we're gonna go into our settings. We're gonna have a look at changing. If we scroll up a bit, we're gonna change the tint. I typically will like a gray glass so we get a bit of that black tone. Makes it look more realistic because it's darker on the inside, much like we did with our AutoCAD drawings as well. And then I'll usually play around a bit more with the opacity. And then that is looking better. And don't worry too much about the reflections yet. Once we add more information here, they're gonna keep looking better and better. For now, we're picking up that sky and it's looking good. I wanna change this brass window now. It's looking pretty rubbish. And what we're gonna do is learn how to add a different higher resolution material. So our normal materials inside here, and some of them will look okay. Some of the default twin motion materials will be okay. But what you find is that there are quite a few that look significantly better as the higher resolution one. So you just need to experiment and see what works best for you. Go back into our library, into mega scans, and then we're gonna go up to surfaces and we are looking for metal and bare. And I've already downloaded some here but let's go ahead and I'll download another one just to show you how to do it. So if you are signed in, all you need to do is click on the little download button up the top right hand corner. You'll see it download like that. And once it's downloaded, you'll be able to drag and drop it into position. Now, brass is actually what we're looking for here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that on there. Then you guessed it, we're gonna go ahead and edit that. So typically I'll pump up the grunge a little bit and that just makes it not look so perfect and flush and uh, too nice. It looks a little bit fake when it's like that. Uh, the scale I might bump up a little bit just because things have come in at a small scale for me. Uh, test on your own machine and then I'm going to come down to the roughness section and I can decide to either make it more reflective so if I bring that down it's going to get really really reflective or if I turn that up it's going to lose its reflectivity so typically I'll just make it slightly more reflective something like 30 is okay with me and then I'm going to scroll back up to the top and I'm going to add a slight filter over this as a tint so let's just bring that in a little bit, just so it's not so perfectly shiny gray. So this is what it comes in as. For me, that's a little bit too much, particularly on this flat edge here. So I'm just bringing it down a little bit. I find once we get further down the line, that's gonna look a little bit better for me. So that's how you add a mega scan material. Let's do another one. So surfaces, wood, and I wanna do a veneer for the door. And once again, I've already downloaded it here. So I've got an oak veneer, but there's plenty in there for you. So veneers I typically use for something that is not made out of boards. So for example, this is all floorboards inside here, and this has uh, face boards inside the actual case study in those elements, but the doors themselves wouldn't be made of boards, of course, It'd be made of a solid unit. So I use a veneer to make it look like it's a solid unit. Then I'm gonna go ahead and once again, I'm going to just change the color a little bit so it suits my case study a bit more. Make it a little darker, maybe not so much intensity. Yeah, there's more of a reddy orange tone to my case study. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm pretty happy with that. And then what I need to do is check that the glass is working, which it isn't. Good, 
So this is something that's going to happen for lots of you. So I'm glad it's happened to me is that because what I'd done in this particular model is only made one pane of glazing for these doors. I just made one flat element. If I go into SketchUp, it's just one pane. There's no double thickness or anything inside there. It's not going to be seen by twin motion until I do some editing to that. So what I need to do is I click on the material that has the glazing. So this one here is fine. It's the same for everywhere. Then I'm going to need to come down into the section down here, which has misc for miscellaneous. And I'm going to turn on two sided. Once we click that, we can see it turns on our glazing. And this is perfect for anything that's only got the one side of the material because you didn't make it into a solid in SketchUp. You can go ahead and turn on two-sided and that'll make sure it's still seen from the other side and not totally invisible. Press escape to get out of that one. We can go ahead and play around with those reflections a little bit more later. I think for now that's fine. I kind of like the dark look that I'm getting from that, that's okay. I'm gonna go ahead and do this grass now. And let's go ahead and make that look something more realistic. So we go to surfaces and to grass. Again, I'm still inside mega scans. To me, I think this stuff just looks better. So I'm gonna do, let's go a wild grass maybe. We'll see how that looks. I'm gonna download our lawn grass as well. And I'll just have a look at the two. This might be too much of a, a fluoro green for me. So I'll drag that on there. Have a look. Um, look, it's okay. Let's have a look at the lawn grass and see if we like it any better. Hmm. Let's bring down the scale of that. Scroll up over here. We'll see what happens if we like it any better when it's a bit smaller. 0 0.5. Hmm. What do we think? It's definitely better than it was. Um, what I'm probably going to do is add some more vegetation over the top of this. So I think this is fine for now because when we get to vegetation in a bit and landscape, I'm going to add more to that. So let's leave that for now. We can go ahead and do some more editing. Uh, I don't like this concrete over here. And I've got some more editing to do in terms of the concrete inside here as well. And these steel columns and that water. So I think probably what's most useful rather than watching me do the same steps again is I'll zoom through this stuff and anything that comes up that's particularly relevant that I haven't already shown for materials, I'll come back to that. So let me zoom through this concrete now. All right, this is definitely one that needs discussing here and that is our water. So water is inside the normal materials and we go down into water, which is down here. And then usually I'll go with a pool, put that in as pool. And then once again, I'll tend to just make this a little bit darker, looks a little bit more realistic, not so fake and plastic. And then I reckon we're looking pretty good for materials, except I've now noticed an inconsistency inside here when I went and had a look at the back of these columns. So at the moment, if I go to the front side, this column on this arch here looking good on this side, material looks fine. However, when I go to the other side of the same column, looking dodgy as. So what we need to do is go back into SketchUp and separate this from the original column so that we can deal with it independently. So if I open SketchUp and I go back, I can see there's another offender over there actually. So let's just go back and fix this column that we're looking at. Which one is it? It is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, it's this one here. So if I double click on this group, right click in here and go make unique texture. Click on that, click create that will turn it into its own independent texture. And then you can either save or you can do your data smith updater. And then I'll go back over to twin motion and I can see that that has updated it there for me. So it's now isolated it. I can put my own independent material onto that one. And then the same thing will happen for this side that I've got here. So I need to click on this face, right click, make unique texture, create texture. Then I'm going to update that, jump back into SketchUp, 
and you can see this one here is now wrapping around the corner properly and so then I can go ahead and put my textures in. So remember I got those three different cinder blocks. I believe it was this one for the columns. Yes it is. And there we go looking good there. So that should now wrap all the way around nicely and it does. Pretty good, happy with that. So I'm going to go ahead and fix up all of these ones as well. They've all got the same issue on the back side for some reason. So let me just zoom through that now and I'll come back to you shortly. All right, that's looking better already. And this is a timely reminder to save your work in progress. So control S for me, I'm gonna save that. Cool, we are getting there with our materials already. I'm pretty chuffed with that. So typically I'll just do a little sweep around the model and kind of just figure out where I'm gonna be taking my shots from and making sure the materials look good in those areas. So I'm probably gonna have an interior one here. I think we're okay with those materials at the moment. Uh, okay, definitely not working from back here, but are we going to take a shot from there? I was thinking about doing this one that we've got on the brief. Uh, yeah, so that wall there does need an update, so I'll go and fix that. And typically, I would fix something like this as well, just because it would annoy me more than anything. And this just happens when two faces are overlapping each other. So what I can do is if I jump back into SketchUp, I'm going to try my best to be where that is. Yeah, there it is. So let's just go ahead and what do I want to do? I want to push that. Yeah, I might just push this in, fudge it a little bit. Let's go with uh, 50 mil. See what happens. Let's live update that. Back to twin motion. Cool. It's a bit of awkward junction going on here but I don't think I'm going to take my shot from this way not from this angle anyway so I'll just fix up this one here back into SketchUp all right that's looking pretty good for now and what I'd like to do is this point I'll just press R for ray trace uh, if I happen to be doing ray traced final perspectives at the end I'd like to see how it's going to come out in terms of the materials I'm pretty happy with how this is looking to be honest how it's collecting the reflections here how the stones looking I'll hit R again and I'll move over a little bit uh, I'm just going to go inside here and see how this one is going to look in the light down a little bit lower R for ray trace even though it's a path tracer they still use R that's fine yeah, I'm not super happy with this texture of the steel. Probably needs a bit more grunge, maybe a bit more reflection or less reflection. So I can play around with that as well. Uh, but we'll look at this more when we get to lighting. So I do that at this point just to make sure I'm using the right materials and then I can go ahead and, and tweak them all again later. That is it for all of our materials. Now we're gonna go ahead and have a look at assets. All right, let's get started with our assets. First thing to know with assets is keep it simple. If you add too much stuff in here, it can look really awkward. The other thing to remember is clustering. We don't typically have even things. For example, if I have a table here and I have an apple in the corner of each end of the table, it's gonna look super weird. It's not gonna look like a natural setting. So just think about how things would actually be in reality. Don't fill it up with clutters and don't try and evenly space everything in the room. Just cluster stuff together just like we would in real life. So what we can do is jump over to our library, I'm gonna go into objects and home, and this is all of our twin motion assets that we've got available to us. When we're inside here, we can just use the search bar to filter stuff. So if I just wanna go table, and hit enter that's going to give us all the tables that are inside the home section uh, i've got some tables that already have chairs on them and i can scroll down here and find tables that don't and sometimes a backyard table might look perfectly fine inside as well depending on how you're going to set it up so for us because in this case study they've got this long bench seat here and then chairs only on one side I think it's gonna be best for us to just use a standalone table. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead with something like this. I think that's fine, just a timber. So download that same as you download any of your materials, you download the assets. When it's done, you can just go ahead and drag it in. Might take a little bit of time depending on your computer to 
load it, and then we can just move it into position. I won't spend too much time on that, you get the idea. And then of course we need chairs next to our table. So we can just go, if we want to, we can go to kitchen and chairs and then just get some chairs that we like. Let's go with just some straightforward, simple metal ones. We download them, bring them in. Not happy with that, so I'm just gonna delete that, download another one. There we go, got this one here. Bring it in, okay. So if I grab on this side here, I can see that allows me to move it around. If I grab on this element here, I can rotate it and I can also type in numbers as well on that one. So for example, if I wanna rotate this by exactly 90 so that I can go and put that at the edge of the table there, I can do that. And then if I hold down shift, that will allow me to copy it, click on copy, click okay. And then I'm gonna rotate that back the other way. So negative 90, move that into the table. And let's just change our view so we can see what we're doing. Yeah, and let's go ahead. And actually I'm just gonna make this table a little bit bigger. So I've got my table there, got my XYZ properties, and I'm just gonna fudge this a little bit by stretching it. So I can see this is the long number there. I'm just gonna make that to three meters. And does that look right? And maybe it's a little bit too long. Let's just go with 2.4. Yeah, that's probably better. I'll just pull it over a little bit. Cool, got our chair, move that one a bit. And then what I'm gonna do is make sure I'm holding down shift, move that one over by the amount we want. And then I'm just gonna do it twice. So I've got both chairs there, beautiful. Okay, and then I've got one more over this side over here. Actually, that might be the way people come in and out there. So I'm just gonna leave that open-sided, cool. So if I wanna change this material that we've got there, T for the eyedropper tool, I can click on it and then it brings up empty properties. So I can't actually change it, but that's easy enough. We can just go back to our library, our materials, and then let's say we want a fabric. I could just go ahead and get this and put it into there. And then that will change it for all of our materials. And because we've added a material to it now, it becomes editable. So if you want to change a material for an asset, but it's not allowing you to do it, all you need to do is add your own material to it, and then you'll be able to make any changes you want to. All right, so I've changed all of them to white. If I wanted to change that table, I could just put a different timber on there too. Let's go ahead and keep adding some more assets. What types of things might we have inside here? So library objects, what would be in our home in the kitchen? Food, okay. Let's chuck a bread loaf, a sourdough on there, great. Maybe we've got some fruit. Over this side. And we could put all the fruit in a bowl, of course, if we want to as well. So we hit bowl and we just gotta go back out into all so that we can see our bowls. And, oh, I like that for a fruit bowl. We can grab that one that white one if we want to whatever see how big this guy is in the middle cool don't forget we can always scale that as well so we can open up that XYZ and scale that or we can come up to the top here click on scale and then I can just very quickly just grab in the center here and I can just scale it in all three dimensions. That might be a little bit too small. Go back over to rotate. I'm just gonna turn this around. Doesn't have to be perfectly 90. Remember life's not perfect. It's not always gonna look amazing in there. And I'm just gonna grab these three. So let's go over to here. And I'm just gonna grab these three. So let's go over and get our apples. So we've got them all over here in our layers tab. So I can just uh, click one and then hold shift to grab all of them. I'm just gonna put them inside here, lift them up a bit. So they sit over the top. 
Okay, and then what I might do is just copy a couple. Copy, push it down, and then let's go another one over here. Put a copy. I'm just holding shift to make the copies. Cool, all right. Yeah, better. Fruit, we've got bread, maybe some glasses on the table. Just go glass. And ah, we're gonna have to filter that more because we've got way too much glass. So let's go objects. And a beer mug, probably not. Ooh, champagne breakfast, let's go. Click on that one and I'm just gonna chuck it in here. Cool. And another one. Not drinking by myself today. And another one over here. Copy. And then let's just get two more. So we'll grab the first one and the second one. And we'll move them over. Copy. I might have just put one over the top of the other one before there. I did. Okay, so let's just delete that one. Delete delete and then we can pick it up again hold down shift put two more over there copy great again don't worry too much about having everything sitting perfectly it just doesn't work like that I think that's fine all right so that table settings all right I'd probably fix that material a little bit on the timber just so it matches the rest of the space if I come down here though once the lighting shifts a little bit it's not as noticeable don't really mind it too much chairs stand out a bit but it's okay uh, and then we're just going to go ahead and really do the same thing so I would put a sink inside here might put some this is a study nook and that's part of the USP for this project so I might put a computer inside here chuck some books maybe a toaster kettle microwave another big sink or tap uh, appliances along the kitchen and yeah we're just going to fill this out with assets and then we're going to have a look at adding some people in so let me zoom through this i'm just going to fill this with some assets for now and then we'll have a look at adding some people All right, so we've got all my assets in there that I want to put in for now. And as I said before, it's all about clustering and keeping things looking realistic without having too much stuff in there. So I've put some extra cushions on here. And in order to do that, I just had to grab some pillows and then you'll see I've changed the scale. So the Z, I've made it half the size so that it gets thinner. And then I've just doubled it in the other two axes so that kind of looks like some bench cushions and you'll find that if you kind of play around and massage different items you can make them look the way you want it to look so you just got to get creative with the way you put your assets in there i've got a little study nook in here some cookbooks a cooking area some accessories and then i've got my tap in there which i've changed the color of the material so that it matches the rest of the stuff. We're gonna have a look at adding assets for lighting in the next video. I've gone ahead and put this one in here already, but don't worry about that one for now because I'm gonna show you that all in one step in the next video, how to find a proper light fitting, how to bring it in, and then how to set it up so that not only you have a light coming out of it, but it looks like there is a light coming out of it. That will all be in the next video. All right, that is our asset in terms of accessories now we want to look at people as assets people really are the tricky part of this mostly because they don't look real and that's because through evolution we've been trained to recognize faces and eyes and all that sort of stuff so as much as clothes and arms and bodies can look photo real unless a human is a human we're pretty damn good at being able to spot 
that it's not. So we have to be kind of sneaky in the way that we put our people inside our shots. Most of the time I recommend that you put people away from the camera just as the base level. Don't put people near the camera because they're not going to look real and that's all we're going to focus on when we're looking at the perspective. Not good. So put the people further away. The second thing is if you can, don't have them facing front on. So don't have them facing the camera. Look at the back of them, look at the side of them, look at them at a slight angle. That kind of helps with tricking the eye as well. And the other thing to do is to kind of obscure them a little bit. So that might be obscuring them by maybe putting them behind a table so we're not looking at them completely. Maybe part of them is kind of framed out by this uh, bulk of the column. Maybe they're sitting back against the window a bit more. Maybe they're kind of walking around the corner. Or instead of a physical obstruction, it might be lighting obstruction. So you might stick them further into the shadow rather than in full light. So let's have a look at putting some people in and see what I mean. We've got animated humans, which uh, they're going to move around and do stuff. Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I wouldn't use them. We're not making a video, so we don't need them to be animated. And they tend to look a little bit funky. What I use instead would be most of the time it would be posed humans. So if we're just going to take a still shot and we can go ahead and use the posed ones, casual would be fine. If we're going to put someone at this table here, maybe we get someone sitting down. Let's just grab this one. Okay. And then we come in here. Normal technique. We're just going to rotate them around. So I'm going to position her. Maybe sink her down a little bit so she's indenting the cushion a bit so her bum wouldn't be floating perfectly over the cushion like it came in like that. That's a bit weird, right? So we want to push it down a little bit until she's starting to sink in a little bit into the cushion, which is what would happen in reality. Um, okay. And then if we're taking a shot like this, the lighting's going to deal with that for us. She's not looking front onto us kind of makes sense that she might be sitting like that at the table, which is good. If, however, I was sitting over here and this was my render, immediately we can see that's not photo real, right? Even if we turn our ray tracing on and we see we've got nicer materials, nicer reflections, nicer lighting out there, our eye is still going to tell us that the one thing in here that stands out most is not real is the person. So that's what I mean about being clever about the way you position them. So for me, this shot that I take from over here is probably going to be something more like this, getting the whole house and looking down the barrel. So she's fine there in that position for me. Another one we might want to have is maybe kids playing in the pool. So we can go back into our post humans. We can go to summer and then let's just have someone maybe going to dive into the pool. That could be cool. Uh, maybe is there a swimming one? Let's see if someone's in the middle of a swim pose, something like that. Ah, there's a jumping into the pool one. That's pretty cool. Yeah, let's go jumping into the pool. Just download that. Cool. Okay, great. Let's rotate her. <laughs> That's a pretty funny jump. I think she was actually seating, uh, but we can pretend that she was jumping up and she crossed her legs. It was a bit of fun. And where's the other one we downloaded before? Outside was this one. Let's have a look. Okay, bit funny. We can see what I'm talking about now with it not being very photoreal. Might put this one lower. Maybe she's sitting down. And she's going to dive in and she's cheering that she's diving in. Cool. That's looking better. And that's just kind of off to the side. So maybe if I was sitting down here, for example, and you're reading a book, looking outside there. Yeah, this one's probably better for that kind of shot, actually. So we don't really need the the full person. And we could imagine that maybe this is um, the parent who wants to sit and watch the kids playing by the pool. There might be another kid over in the grass. This is part of the USP in terms of those lines of sight. So yeah, this is probably going to be a better shot for that. And we can block out that person. We don't really need two people, especially if I am that person. So if that's the parent and I'm placing the camera as though I'm sitting down here reading a book and watching the kids, then I wouldn't need to have that second person in there anyway. 
So that is adding people in. You just wanna make sure that they either their back is to us, they are further away from us, or they are being obscured by the light and the shadow. All right, so that is our assets and our people. Now what we wanna do is add in our landscaping. All right, so on to landscaping now, and it's pretty straightforward, very similar in terms of the process that we would do for assets. So we go to our library, over to vegetation, and I'm gonna start by putting some shrubbery along this wall here. So we go into bushes, and then I'm just gonna to go to bush base two, which is this one here. At the moment, it's pretty massive. And what you'll find is if you're similar to me, you're gonna to have to go up a little higher in order to be able to see what you're doing as well, because you need to have it on a flat surface. Basically, whatever surface you put it on, it's gonna go perpendicular to that angle. So I need to be above it so I could put it in the right position. And I've got a couple of options. I can just kind of go along here and click it along one by one. We see that that one didn't quite land where it's supposed to, so I'll just do another one here. And we just add them in one by one and delete the ones that we don't want. And then we've kind of got our rough bushes. And so if we go over to our scene tab, we can grab all of the bushes that we put in there and just pull them down a little bit and make sure they're at the right height and in the right location. The other thing we notice that it's got a size tab over here. Now it says that it's the smallest it can go, but if I actually grab on this, we'll notice that it can go significantly smaller than it is now. It's probably closer to what I'm looking for anyway, really, because if anything, it was too overpowering before. So let's go up. And there we go. There's the problem. So I had a few out there that I've got to delete and get rid of. Now, that's option one. Option two is I can actually just grab some of these, much like our other assets, and just copy them over. So let's just put three of those in there. Yeah and I'll just move it around to where I want it. All right, the, the problem with copying though is it'll copy its exact position. And so it does tend to look like a copy and paste. We can see that this is the same as that is the same as that. Whereas when I was clicking them before one by one, there does have more of a randomness effect to it. So if you are gonna make copies, just keep in mind that you're gonna to have to go back through and do a little bit of editing like this just to rotate stuff around and make sure it doesn't all look too perfect. Always go back to the height that you're going to take your angle from. So for me, that tells me that they need to move over a little bit. So back into my tab here, and I'm just gonna pull them over a little bit, and maybe up a little bit, and forward this way. Okay, that's better. And then I'm going to also add, just to mix it up a little bit, maybe a taller one this one, which can sit at the end, or maybe do I want it in our front view here? Yeah, maybe just there. Cool, adds a little bit extra foliage and that's gonna help in my foreground when I don't really have anything going on beyond that. So that's good from further back here. Yeah, just something to fill in that foreground over there is good, okay. Same thing I'm gonna do up the top over here. I'm just gonna change the plants around a little bit. So I'll zoom through that quickly. I'm gonna go with some ferns this time. And remember, try and choose stuff that's relevant to the context of your case study. No point in putting a bunch of tropical plants like the ones I'm doing here, if you know this is gonna be in Tasmania, for example. All right, let's go back and have a look. Okay, not too bad. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. I might just go back through and adjust the height once again. So I've got the ferns that I can find, all of those ones up there. It's another reason why you might wanna change what plant you put in each area, just so that they kind of layer themselves together. Of course, you could just make that into a group if you want to. So while I've got them all selected over here, I can go right click and go move to new container. And then I can just say the balustrade ferns, something like that, whatever. And then that's got them all grouped together. So if I need to find them again later as well, I can just toggle them all on and off there. Happy days. After we've got our small stuff, we're gonna go up into our bigger trees. Now the trees I find the trickiest part because twin motion isn't made in Australia and it's not made in the Southern Hemisphere either. We don't typically have trees that are appropriate. 
And so we end up using stuff that belongs in America or in Asia or in Europe. It doesn't feel like it belongs. Now, you might be coastal. You might have some big um, Norfolk pines or something like that, and therefore it does make sense. But yeah, really, you're just going to have to play around and choose something that looks right for you. Um, I tend to go with the fruit trees because we're more likely to just have that kind of thing, particularly suburban Australia. We might have a lemon tree or a lime tree or an apricot tree or something like that out the front. And so I might play around with like a lime tree and then make it a bit bigger. So I can grab on this, turn the age up so that gets bigger, play around with its location. But ultimately, you're just going to have to experiment with this until you feel like it's looking the way you want it to look. For now, I'm actually just going to go with an olive tree. And because we could have this where we are for this particular house. And it also doesn't cover up too much of the house that I'm playing with. Again, this is going to depend on how important the landscape is to your house as well that you've looked at. But just do your best. Use trees you feel like they look appropriate to the house you are working with and you should be fine. All right, so that is our shrubs and our trees. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to add some grasses and some other little bits and pieces into here. What I wanna try and do is soften these sharp edges a bit. So even if we had the trimmer out every single weekend, we're never gonna get an edge this sharp and it just looks fake and unrealistic. So I wanna put some actual grass over this because remember that was just an image texture that we put down there before. And then I'm also gonna get maybe some long strands of grass maybe it looks like it hasn't been mowed or maybe it's a little bit artistic along the edge there and we might even chuck some flowers in there so to do this we could do it bit by bit like we did before but it would take forever to do that so what we're going to do is a populate tool instead so if we click on populate and then we click foliage and then we click paint it's going to allow us to paint some foliage in so i'm going to go over to grass and flowers and then I'm gonna choose a long grass. Let's go with number three. And then with my paintbrush, are we going for size? Yeah, 1.1, that's probably about right. We could go a little bit bigger, but we'll start with that. And we'll see it very quickly allows us to fill the area. Don't worry if you go over edges, we're gonna erase some of that in a second. If we go too far, we'll get a smaller brush in there. I'm just trying to fill it in nice and evenly. And I'll get some going along this edge here around the tree as well. Beautiful. Okay, pretty happy with that. Let's fill in a little bit more. Okay, so now as promised, let's erase some. So eraser, we could make our brush a little bit smaller if we want to, but let's just try this for now. Cool, good, that's allowing us to cut some out of there. And I'm just kind of clicking through. Maybe we're clipping a little too much off there because we can see we've lost probably too much there. So I'll swap it back to paintbrush again. I'll try and put this in at 0.5. So we can half that and see what happens, 0.5. And then I'll paint this back in. Yeah, beautiful. And I'll paint this patch in there so it doesn't look too patchy. There's another patch around there, another patch there, another patch along here. Cool, need our eraser again because we've got some grass in the window, which we can't have that. Oh, that's me painting it in. Here we go. Let's erase that out. Erase, erase, erase. Erase, erase. Get rid of that in there. Get rid of that out of there. Don't need grass growing inside the glazing. Cool. And then we need to get rid of all this stuff that's in the concrete slab at the front there. So we just get rid of that gear. Cool. Looking much better already, much more realistic. So we've got a couple of options now. We can either add another type of grass in here to fill up all the patches, or we can start a new paint. Let's try option one first. So I'm gonna grab long grass number one, put that in there, and we'll see that it just kind of fills in the gaps for us by adding a second type of grass. And we can add another one in there as well if we want to, and that'll fill in all the gaps. And I'm pretty happy with that as an option. I could go back here and just delete a bit more of this along the footpath there so we can definitely see where we're going for our footpath. And I'm pretty happy with that. Cool. Um, where this becomes an issue though, and where we wouldn't want to use that, is if for example, 
we had some feature graphs, something like these tall reeds. If we were to put that in here as well, we see that it puts it absolutely everywhere. Uh, so basically everywhere that we've already painted is the area where it's going to start filling stuff inside here. So what I would want to do if I had a feature graph, something like that, is to actually start a new one again. So we come back down here to populate. Same thing again, foliage paint. And then I'm going to go my tall grasses, number two. And then what I'm going to do is just paint some along this edge over here. So just along that edge there. And we notice we've got a problem. And the problem is with our brush size. So because the brush isn't big enough for the actual object that we're painting in, it's not going to come through. So I'll bump this up to a meter instead. And we'll see if that detail grass starts to come through now. It hasn't. Let's try 1.5. Let's see if it comes through now. Beautiful. And there it is. It's come through. As so we've got that detail grass along the edge. Now that might be too big. So we might actually get rid of that one there by starting a new populate. And again, and then we go to tall grass one this time. Let's see how we go. And I'll put some along that edge there. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. It's breaking it up a little bit and I might just come back through and randomize it by just deleting out some chunks. Just leaving some random. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm just trying to soften this edge along here where it might grow a little longer. And we'll do another one over here. We're gonna add some flowers in. So once again, populate. And I'm gonna add, let's go with some buttercups. You'll find that the buttercups come in probably a little too thick and fast if I paint it. So if we go populate, and then foliage and paint, drag the buttercups in. We'll see what happens when I start painting these, is it just goes a, probably a little bit too crazy with the buttercups there. Instead, what I will do, is I'll get rid of that, and I'll actually just drag them in one at a time, because I just want a couple of these kind of nesting around the tree there, as so they've just started to sprout underneath the tree. Much better. So you're kind of going to have to pick and choose. In some instances, painting everything like we did with the grass will be fine. Others, one edge will be fine. And then others, again, you're just going to have to manually put it in bit by bit. And you get used to that as you go. And of course, it's going to change depending on where we're going to put our camera and what we're going to be looking at. It's going to change how we should do the landscaping. Then once we've got our camera into position, you're going to want to test and experiment with your garden. So for example, you might want to move the tree around, might want to pull it forward so that I can show more of the architecture of the building, might want to push it further back, I might want to change its size and make it much, much smaller so that I can see what's going on. I might want to make it bigger, although I know the olive tree does get pretty funky when you make it too big, so we'll undo that. You're just going to have to experiment and play around with your landscape to get it working. Something that is annoying me is this grass in here. So what I'll do is I'll have a look down to where the grass is. I can see it's coming over the stones. So I put my eraser back on and then I'm just going to erase through here and make sure that's all nice and clean. Uh -huh. And probably a little bit over there as well, but we're gonna to need to make our brush smaller, otherwise we'll lose it all. Let's try 0 0.7 and see how that goes to get rid of that stuff. I have to go a little further in. Same on this side, might have to go a little further in. Yeah, we do. Cool, okay. And we'll go back over here. Let's put our tree back where it's supposed to be, not going through the wall. We'll rotate it around a little bit and see what's the best position for this particular tree. Might even be worthwhile putting it this way, but rotating it. Let's see what happens. As long as we're not gonna have roots coming out of the ground or anything weird like that, I reckon it could be okay. Back up to eye height. Yeah, not looking too bad. Kind of looks like the tree is pushing up towards the sun, which we know does happen. Cool. I reckon it's getting pretty close to what we want. We might want to thicken up these hedges a bit more so we don't get so much white 
space coming through there. I'm very happy with how the ferns turned out. I like this kind of little bit of landscape coming up to meet with the archers, helping us to show off our USP there. Pretty happy with it. So it's probably just this line here that I would want to mess around. And depending where my final camera position is going to be, I'd want to clean up just this little mess that's sitting over the top of our stonework. But other than that, pretty happy. And that is our landscaping. That's all for the first video on Twin Motion, having a look at your materials, assets, and landscape. What you want to do now is have a go at those three skills, get your model up to pretty much the same point my model was at the end of this video. Then when you are ready, move on to the next video where we have a look at lighting and camera direction.